So the beautiful thing about crypto is it doesn't have to take over, just like the iPhone didn't take over every landline. You know, Sam Bankman Free, the moment he said that he's doing it and he's going to give all his money away is the moment you should run. It's all around us, but people aren't looking. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the podcast in partnership with the Emirates Lit Fest and the Jahi events. Jamil Abu Warder, he's a crypto guy, and you should be listening to him. He talks about crypto in a very simple language, a language that you will understand. Why is this important? Because so many of us are not trying to learn about crypto. We're kind of poo-pooing it. We're putting it off. We're not investing our time. We're not understanding what NFTs are. We're not understanding what the Web3 movement is. The future of money and investing is here in this space. And this episode is for all of you that don't know that would like to learn from an expert that's spoken at Harvard University and done numerous TED Talks on the matter. Let's cue the music for this very informative episode. Thank you to Najahi Events, who have been sponsoring us now on the podcast for over a year. Najahi bring motivational speakers to the region to help inspire, educate, and motivate you to achieve better success and live a better life. Jamil, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. You're welcome. You're here at the Lit Fest. You've been here before? I have been at the Lit Fest, and I think it's an incredible thing. I mean, it's been going for 15 years, but I've been coming for the last few. What is it you like about it? The fact that they actually don't talk about things and they do things. And this is, I think, a Dubai, um, I would say it's a unique thing. They bring the world to this place, even though it's niche. The fact that a literature festival with some of the biggest names in author, whether it's authors or actually agents and all those, they bring them to Dubai and they've been going long enough for it to be noticed globally. And this is an intellectual conf conference and convention and there just aren't enough of those, I think. I think t t today, it really, I mean, I've been coming here for a few years, but today it really kind of hit home with me when I was sitting with Lord Geoffrey Archer and interviewing him, who arguably is the most successful novelist of our time. Yeah. With, you know, what did he, what is he? He's done 30 books. He's done uh, 250 million in sales or 250 million sales. Um, and arguably, you know, there's, there's not many people that compete with that. He's got to be in the top yeah. five at least. So when they bring that kind of talent here, for me, that demonstrates that they're serious, they're committed, and uh, there's a following for it. Yeah. I mean, look, I'll tell you, my background, studied engineering, but went into media. So the storytelling aspect, mm -hmm. being able to tell a story, and I think business, anybody will tell you if you, your business is the story that you can tell and what, you know, why people buy from you. And I say this because too few people understand the importance of actually being able to write a book or write an article very well and how that leads. So even the biggest Hollywood blockbuster, somebody has to sit down and write the dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. So writing is where everything starts and too many people focus, especially, I'm gonna be very honest, in this region, they focus on the image, mm -hmm. but you just need people to be able to write stories. And this is why I'm saying this is an important thing. And I know within the next year or two, there's going to be some books and some stories that are going to put this region on the map and this is the kind. Of, this is the festival that's made it happen. For sure. It's funny you say that. I was with Anil, the boss of Arabian Business, the other day, and we were sitting in his office. He's like, "I love your content, Ben. It's great your content. Don't ever ask me to come on your podcast. Don't ever ask me to be in front of the camera. That's not my thing." He said, "That's your thing." He said, "But sit with me for ten minutes, and I can write a book about it." So tell us a bit about yourself. I, I follow you and listen to what you do with uh, your understanding of the crypto space, the Web three, and what's going on there. And I think it's a world that, you know. I just, there are some communities where people are getting it and there's the vast majority that are still either hiding from it, shying away from it. And then, an, I don't know, an FTX scandal happens. And then like, I told you so, that's why I didn't need to be involved. How did you get involved in it? Lovely. Um, so, you know, zooming through 15 or 20 years of career, I studied engineering, was in London, went into media because NBC, Middle East Broadcasting, was based there in the 90s. And, and, they just would hire anybody who speaks Arabic, and I speak Arabic. Um, and because I got my start in media, I began, so there's, you could call it the entrepreneurial side of me. I began um, going out and 
filming stuff and doing things. Um, and it led to, within media, a lot of the technology companies would be the sponsors or the advertisers. Mm -hmm. So I'd work with technology companies. And what happened past 2010 is media and technology merged. So the Googles, the Facebooks, all of these. So I, first of all, understand how to tell a story. But then being able to tell a story about technology, you have to understand the technology. And I've, I've always liked tech. So it I kind of it kind of came to me, but I was working within tech and I went into technology, launching technology products, not just in the Middle East, but from China to any market. So my job, again, randomly came to me um, five years before COVID. I was working in brand licensing. So you stick a brand onto, let's say, a microphone it's being made in China. And if people see the brand, they'll buy the microphone. Everything is made in China. And I can tell you, I've been to the vacuums. Um, and also the online, getting stuff out there. So basically not just selling it online, but publishing. You have to be able to tell a story. So these two things are great. You know, communications went online. Business went online. And the thing that kept everything, um, I'd say, tied together is money. And back in 2014, 2015... I knew about Bitcoin. I thought it was a scam and something that, you know, it's too expensive to buy. But a friend of mine, he launched a couple of products. Um, one of them was just an ATM here. It was the first. Um, and then several after that claimed to be the first. But it got shut down after a day. But because he was in the national, the newspapers, uh, he got asked by several of banks, management consultancies to come and give talks and workshops. Now, one thing that I would say, you know, in, in your career and in your life, some things happen to get noticed more than others. Um, I did a TED talk in 2010, and it was in the, the real TED in the UK. It was my second time to do a talk on stage. And it's been, so I got known as, uh, it was about culture and how you can um, change people's perception. But it was through comedy. So I got known as the comedy guy through my TED talk. But the beautiful thing is I got invited to a lot of conferences where it was about A, culture, but B, changing um, people's ideas and perceptions and whether it's through storytelling or through technology, I think they meet. Now, how it's relevant to my friend. He gets called in, can you do these presentations? He says, I don't know how to do presentations. I do the tech. So we started going in together. I told him, look, my price is take me in with you. So we started explaining Bitcoin, blockchain, the management consultants, bankers. We became part of the blockchain council of the government of Dubai that was formed. We were there for a year and a bit. And it was that was the second time that Bitcoin was going through a rise back in 2017. But I was still, I would say, one foot in, one foot out. When I saw what happened then, I stayed with it. 2018, 2019, I started investing and putting money in. And I can gladly say that I've made a lot of mistakes. And these mistakes, and right now we're living it, are the ones that when you make them, you definitely aim. And I'm very confident um, we're going to have a global rise in basically the stock market as well as crypto. And I've been for the past two, three years very much focused on getting people on board, explaining it further to companies, but I will be honest and say it's in parallel. You have to have what I've been doing, which is media and tech, launching businesses, launching products, but at the same time, putting at least half of my time in crypto. What fascinates you about crypto and where where it started and where it's going? Now, it's very easy for me because I've made this mistake in 1999. I was in media. I went and worked for an internet company nine months before the bubble burst. Mm -hmm. So I literally was with i was in london it was a sales role i said you know what creative is nice but i'm going to go for the money and then they ran out of money the company i was with but so did every company mm -hmm. and the mistake i made then and i'm calling it a mistake is i went back into media and i left the internet side behind me so i did a decade 2000 2010 fully focused on media but if i had stayed in that failed internet world, I would have gained, I think, you know, what we've seen, the growth of those companies would have been where I would be a, ma a big part of it. Now, this is happening with Bitcoin, blockchain, crypto. 
we are at the beginning of a new technology. It is not like anything that's happened before. So exactly like the internet, nothing like what happened before. We are there again. I love human minds, human brains, community, things that come together. The beautiful part about crypto, forget about the scammers and all these for a moment. People are actually building. People are serious about it and pay attention. There's a big, you know, camaraderie. People collaborate. People want to see more good people. Strong community. Strong community. And, and it's at the beginning. So my point is, I won't make that mistake again two decades later of ignoring the new shiny thing just because it failed once or twice at the beginning. So just like the internet had all these companies that failed to be whatever they were going to be, it's um, it's a learning process and I'm there. What needs to happen in that space for people to feel safe that it's the, the right way to be investing their money? The first thing I'll say is crypto, and I'll be more specific about blockchain, mm -hmm. is much more than simply money. So it's going to be affecting the way technology works together. And, you know, this isn't, I'm not going to explain it on the podcast, but decentralization, two people being able to send something directly to each other, whether it's information. So I can send you a photo. It doesn't have to be uh, a, you know, something like a coin token, or I could send you a document. So let's say it's the land deed, and I don't need it to be going through a land department. Once it's issued, it's everybody can see that it's real. That bit of the technology, the idea that humans are no longer needed for trust mm -hmm. is the biggest thing for me. So does that answer the question? No longer needed for trust. Does that mean we can't trust humans? You can trust humans to be greedy. <laughs> <laughs> you can trust humans. You know, the seven sins are there, whether it's, um, you know, in scripture or in a movie. They're very real. Humans are fallible. Humans are emotional. Computer scripts are as strong as whoever programmed them. But after a while, once they work a few thousand times without mistakes, the mistakes become less and less likely. And therefore, I'll, I'll give you a real example, actually. It's a book, I think, Malcolm Gladwell, if I'm not mistaken, one of the books has something about doctors uh, given, doctors who uh, diagnose illnesses and the illness is cancer. In this book, it says uh, they asked a bunch of doctors seven signs of cancer and they showed them x-rays, just these seven signs. And they put the same x-rays through a computer. They showed what maybe, let's say, 100 doctors, these x-rays and asked for diagnoses. All of them diagnosed it differently and just based on these seven signs. And some of the x-rays were the same x-ray twice. And the same doctor would diagnose the same x-ray two times in different ways. Wow. This is... And this is how humans operate. They depends on time of day, day of week, all of that. But the computer got exactly the same result each time. So I trust the computer before I trust the person when it's programmed in the correct way. It's interesting you say that. It takes me back to 2012 when I had spinal surgery. I went to London and I booked appointments with 10 neurosurgeons in Harvey Street. And the first neurosurgeon I saw went, oh, that's a microdisectomy you need there, boy. The second one was, was well, that spinal fusion surgery. Third one, something else. And it was just like this, how do I choose? Different people have different opinions. Yeah. And one surgeon said, how did you break the bone? And the other nine hadn't even seen the broken bone. And so who, who, who do you rely on? Had I gone with the first person, you know, and maybe my mum said, oh, you need to go to doctor, what's his name? Because he's the right guy. And he diagnosed it as a microdisectomy. It might have been something completely wrong for what I needed. Yeah. And so that's the problem of humans. So it's not about trusting their emotion and greed as much as literally the same data can be given to the same person. And unless they're methodical like a computer, they're going to make two different decisions about them. You don't know what mood that doctor's in that morning. You don't know what's happened in his life. He might have just had some road rage in the car on the way in. But <laughs> those things affect people though, don't they? You know, you think about that. Human emotions will affect people. Greed's another thing that affects people in a big way too. Absolutely. Power, greed, all of these. You know, again, something that has existed. I think it will always exist. So the thing that's beautiful about crypto is the fact that people now have a new choice that they think. Let me say it again. So the beautiful thing about crypto is it doesn't have to take over, just like the iPhone didn't take over every landline. You still have landlines mm -hmm. if you need a landline, mm -hmm. but there's a brand new technology that's full of apps. 
and everybody's using. And it's not just Apple. It gave rise to a whole industry and how we actually communicate today. And that's exactly where we are with crypto. So people think of it as, oh, it's going to replace whatever money they use today. It's not going to necessarily replace it. It's a new way of doing it. It's an add-on. It's plus. That's a great way of describing it, actually. You think about it. It's like what's going on now with AI. It's really interesting how, you know, it is a, a matter of a few weeks, this chat GBT is on everyone's lips all of a sudden. And they're like, what's that? What's that? And now everyone's logging in and trying it out and using it. And, you know, Microsoft have, have offered $10 billion that are in stage payments to help develop that. And when you, you look at that, will it replace everything? No, it won't replace everything. But it's definitely going to be a benefit to some things. But did we know about it? Most people hadn't heard about it. I mean, most people still haven't heard about it. After that. I have, so I think everyone has. But most people still I haven't. I think heard because about it. we're on this, you know, similar social media, the LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever. You know, a lot of people are talking. about It's a big buzz there. But if you go into a mall and ask somebody about ChatGPT, and this is one of my biggest tests in anything. You know, walk into a mall, ask ten people about whatever it is you think is taking over, and crypto is a great example. Very small adoption. It's so small. If you, are, you know, people will have heard about maybe Bitcoin and they'll say, oh, it's a scam. That's fine until it's like the iPhone, 2007. I can tell you, and my wife can tell you, I held on to my BlackBerry because it has the buttons yeah. for the longest time. I, everybody, I was like, why would I want a piece of glass? What I didn't I, at all, I like technology and I use devices. I'm a, you know, a gadgets guy. I didn't understand that it's the apps, because I'd never had an app before. Mm -hmm. That was the big play. Mm -hmm. The idea that people are going to start programming things, and they just gave it iOS, and people started making games, and then they started taking off over the map industry, you know, like maps, you have your, whether it's Google or whatever. And that bit is what you don't even know is coming, mm -hmm. is the exciting. Well, if you go back to the beginning of the BlackBerry, you know, the fact that we got emails on our phone was like, Dun, 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 you know, now I've got everything. Oh, I, can, I can do everything with my little scrolly button down the side and exactly the same as you, very comfortable with the buttons. And then it was like, what do you mean I'm not going to have buttons? Hey, why would you do that? That's ridiculous. But as slowly you kind of like, you embrace it and you adopt it. Nokia sold that technology to Apple. That's how it happened. They, they, they invented touchscreen technology and they sold it and then went bust on the back of it. So yeah, another one. Okay. So. We've, we, we, we've got all of these coins. We've got the main coins, your, your Ethereums, your Bitcoins, your, your, your Solanas, your Ripples and stuff, the ones that people have kind of heard of. And then you've got your brrr, list and list and list of coins. Yes. That in the uh, first month of this year, in January of this year, a lot of them have had staggering returns. I mean, Bitcoin's up 40% and yep. lots of these, some of them are up 100%. I've even seen some that are 200% up in that period of time. Yep. That gets people excited. But how does somebody sit down and analyze what coin to buy and why? The first thing, uh, again, I oh, I, I tried to go helicopter view on things. Well, hold on, let, let's take an example. Let's say you and I were sitting having dinner one night. I said, yeah. oh, Alex, okay, he's really into X, Y, Z, one, two, three. You would say, tell me about it. And I'd say, I'm not sure I know much about it, but it's done 25% today. What's then your process of going to research that? Um, first of all, if it's already done, 25%, I'd be cautious because it's not likely to go up that much. But what I'd say is uh, rushing in is the worst thing you can do. Um, the fact is, so if you look at 2009, Satoshi, Bitcoin being launched, we're talking about a decade and these kind of amazing returns. So new coins that get launched do have the potential with a little money. So, you know, let's say it's a million. To, to be a 10x, it just has to become 10 million. But if you're at 100 million, a 10x is a lot more difficult because you need a lot more money to make that. So the first thing is, how do you make a decision on what you're being told over dinner? Is decide whether over the next three months you're going to be interested in looking at that. Mm -hmm. I know that that's not the way people operate. So again, humans, greed, oh my God, I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to the moon, so get in quick. So that's a lesson learned. I had somebody here who knew someone in an investment house and this investment house put $50 million in of their uh, investors' money into a coin here in Dubai. It had a use case and it went nowhere. It doubled and then it went right down. Mm -hmm. And we had put, you know, I have a group of friends. I do networking, but literally in my house. 
So I love putting people together, uh, uh, even literally in my garden. I have six friends, and it, at one point there were 24 people. Everybody brought a friend. And we just, you know, we call it a, a moon burger night because it's we just order burgers and everything's going to the moon. And um, what happens is people start to exchange information and they're there. But that's during everybody's smart when everything is going up. And that's where I'm saying zoom out, look at a four year period. But really in business, anybody will tell you about the five to seven year period and you know, for people who aren't in business, just property, property prices, they always go through a big rise and they then go through a slump. And it's the same with the stock market. My point being that because we're dealing with companies, what people need to realize is every project was created, whether it was by one teenager in a bedroom or a bunch of people, there are people behind these projects. There isn't an AI yet that's just launching projects and advertising them. So the first thing is, Who's behind this? And a lot of projects that did very well have anonymous people behind them. That's cute. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. But unless you know who the anonymous person is and that's your friend and they have a, a way that they're going to get this out there, I'd avoid it. And this is where, again, this is through experience, being at one of my burger nights and somebody saying, you need to get this animal koala uh, you know, face token. And then it goes nowhere. Now, there is a way and it is, there are, they say, two science camps. One is traders, people who follow charts and they apply systems and these do work if you follow your system. And the other one is just launching a company. When you have a company being launched, two other people behind it, what's their plan? Mm -hmm. There are things called tokenomics. Mm -hmm. So it's similar to shares. If very smart, rich people are launching something, you can guarantee that they're going to make more money than you. So you need to figure out which stage are you at. And the thing about the other camp is you can guarantee that the rich guys who are launching something, they are going to make money. And you need to know and be realistic as to whether you're early enough, whether you're an insider even, or you're the person they're going to make the money from. And that's what they call a pump and dump. Yep. Meaning they release the tokens on the market. It's worth $1, it becomes $10. Yeah. They've got 10 million of those tokens each and they just sell them. You've just bought and made them rich mm -hmm. and they don't care what happens after that. And the nicest rich people in the world do that because it's a way to make money and it's legal at the moment. Of course, regulation comes in and the more regulation that comes in that avoids that kind of thing happening, the better. And it's at this point, I'd love to separate completely something like Bitcoin from everything else, including Ethereum. Bitcoin is one of only four or five coins that are out there on the internet running themselves. Yes, there's people with a lot of money that can move those coins in certain directions. But after a while, when there's much bigger adoption, it is a very strange thing. People don't understand that the code is running it. People aren't. So if I separate that, if it's a project, who's running it, who's in, why are you jumping in? If you believe your friend, go ahead, but don't put all your money in one place. What are the four or five coins then that you believe are running themselves? So Bitcoin, what else? I'd have to look it up. I don't have it. Okay, so there's a few out there. I, I, so can I, I, I'll, you can ask me the question again. I can't ask. So what are, what are the other, what are the other coins? I actually looked it up because I was giving a talk. I looked up which coins are these are truly decentral, decentralized. And I would advise people to go and Google that question. I don't even remember the, the other four. Um, and I should. <laughs> but uh, the idea is truly decentralized. Again, it's arguable, but it's much better than a bunch of people launching tokens that they own. Whether it's a majority or whatever it is, they're controlling it. Then when we look further and we talk about the metaverse and Web3, we... See, the metaverse feels to me like it's something that's that's not as advanced almost in its in it, in its kind of familiarity as Bitcoin. Um, also, there's a lot of competition for the various metaverses that are all in play at the moment. There seems to be a lot, and there doesn't seem to be a way to jump from one metaverse to another metaverse with your assets. True. You have to kind of leave them behind almost. And so for me, moving from one to the other would be important. They're, one of the sponsors of the podcast is a company called Vault Hill, and they help establish brands 
into the metaverse uh, in record time. So they charge a fee and they can get that brand in there. A lot of brands haven't understood it. They're sitting on the fence. We, we hear the ones that have, but the vast majority haven't. Absolutely. Is it really too early? Are we kind of like getting excited about something that's probably a few years away still and we shouldn't really be bothered just yet? Um, so when you mention the metaverse, um, it's funny because I am from the camp that games and gaming are already in a metaverse. People live inside a game. I'm not a gamer. I just for one of the management consultancies um, wrote a, a paper. So they do these papers that they launch at conferences. So they got in touch with me because they wanted the metaverse angle, but it was about gaming and the metaverse. So they said, could you have a look at everything else as well? So I, I finished this paper for them. And within this, the beauty is it's a gaming, it's about gaming and how it's become an event space business. So games, there are massive events where people min win millions of dollars. And Saudi is very big in this and they put a massive investment behind um, a vehicle that's going to bring all of this to Saudi. One example. So that is where, and it's not teenagers. A lot of people think, oh, it's young people. It's skewed to 40 and above now. So Gamer. people, yeah, gamers. There are people who are, by the way, on your mobile phone, you play games. Never. That's okay. But a lot of 40 and 50 plus year olds play games on their mobile. My dad does. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to say this out loud. I can't believe I'm about to say this. He does it on the toilet in the morning. <laughs> yeah. He does it every morning. He sits there because my mum says, why is he going to take the phone to the toilet? <laughs> it's amazing. It's, it's because it, it's a boredom killer, right? They just, they're just they bored. They want to, maybe your dad is very good at his game. I'm not going to go there. But that's my point. It's about, you just, it's all around us, but people aren't looking. And I say this because, so I can tell you, fact, gaming over $220 billion worth in the US alone, and it's worth more than movies and music combined. One of the biggest stats that I find that, 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 that gives this real credence is Gary Vaynerchuk said, he said, there's more, there will be more people by the end of this decade watching people play games than watching live sport. Yes. So they'll be watching FIFA, people play FIFA on their computers than, than are watching it on the television live, the actual game itself. Yes, I agree. And I can see it happening on YouTube. That blows my mind. You know, I've got daughters that are 20 and 23 now. Yeah. I bought them all of the PlayStations, the Xboxes, the Wiis, and all that kind of stuff. They weren't ever interested. Their phones, they never play games. I don't know why. There wasn't like I discouraged them or anything, but they never did. And I never did either. Yeah. And then there's this world that exists of all these people on Twitch. Yes. Twitch is where the streaming happens. Twitch and playing these games and like... Then we saw the Fortnite competition a couple of years ago and the guys at the Fortnite World Championships, that 15-year-old kid, one and a half million dollars. I think that that triggered people to go, yes. hold on a minute, is this real? Yet there's parents now that have got kids that are saying, um, yeah, no, when I grow up, I want to be a YouTuber. Or when I grow up, I want to be a gamer. Yeah. And it's like, well, you can't be that. That's ridiculous. Well, Mr. Beast is. And he is. And he, yeah. Exactly. And, the, and, he, and his channel's worth over a billion dollars, so they say. Yeah. And there are kids out there making a fortune out of gaming. Mr. Beast was offered a billion dollars and he said no. That's right. Because he knows it's going to go to 10 plus. So I'm just, now I'm relating it back to crypto in the sense that, so people are waiting and thinking, is there a metaverse? You don't play games, I don't play games, but a parent or a grandparent does. So my point A is, it's not just the kids and there are people, so the Xboxes and all of this, people are now all over 30 who started in that generation. 90s is when it started. So very comfortable around games. And there are millions and actually billions of people within them, if you include mobiles these days. So mobile phones, every mobile has games on it. And then people are downloading them. Now, introduce crypto, meaning in-game money. When people and people already, my son, I just bought him for $10 skins for Roblox. Skins and clothes, yeah? Yeah. So he plays Roblox and because all the kids in his class do very limited time he gets so he's not happy because they get a lot longer and they've gone more advanced but i've done it because of the exactly what we're talking about i don't want him to get hooked on it but i just want to be able to even say this to you i've just spent ten dollars in an imaginary world all right and this is something that people are going to want to spend of course he's come back and said but can i have this and this and this so he already wants more and i say this now if you're a grown-up and you just want the sword and somebody else has a sword and they want to charge you more for, for what they bought it. You don't need dollars 
you just need to have converted into the coin that's in the game. So Fortnite coin, you know, I'm just giving names of games that people yes. know. Um, but within crypto, so example, crypto has given rise to companies that are building crypto native games. They take three to five years to actually have any game worth playing. A lot of people think, yeah, they're all crap. And yeah, the crap ones are the ones that you can just copy paste and put out there. A genuine game takes three to five years. It's a big production. Yeah. And I've talked to and even done uh, Zooms with people out in uh, the Far East as well as in the West who are building some of these games and whose coins became their, their project became worth two and five billion dollars just over a year ago. It's way down, down by 80 or 90 percent, but they're still building. Fascinating. Tell me about your business. Tell me exactly what you do, how you do it and why you do it. Two things in parallel. There's the media and marketing angle to what I do, which is you want to launch a business and you need that. And I'm actually, again, on purpose, uh, give it, I give workshops for crypto and I help companies in crypto uh, launch. So there's the what messaging are you going to put out there? What kind of plan and strategy are you going to uh, use to get people on board? And I find the disconnect. So there's why I'm mentioning both is when you're in normal media, what we're doing here is you need to talk to people like they're people mm -hmm. and actually talk to them at their level. Mm -hmm. What happens in crypto, and I think it is changing, is a lot of companies are, you know, they're so much in love with their, their they drink their own Kool-Aid yeah, and they're in that world. They forget that most people aren't in. So what do I do? I sit there and say, you're going to have to explain it in a way that they understand. Yeah, but that's not, you know, we're much uh, more complicated than that. It doesn't matter because people don't care until they feel like, basically you have to make people feel like they understand or like they're special. The only other reason they jump on boards is if they think they can make some money very quickly, mm -hmm. which is that's the biggest reason it's happening. That's what happened with um, the, they call it the bull run. The bull run was just short-lived. Everything went up in price, but then the bigger money went out and it follows the economy. People want something more real, a solid asset, you know, cash. I've been in the investment business for 30 years. There's always something that's doing well. You know, even though you've got a bear here and a bull there, there's always something, if you know what to invest in, doing well. And a great example of that is what happened with crypto. A crypto fell off a cliff last year. What accelerated for property prices here went through the roof. Yeah. And so people have invested in property. Now, crypto fell off a cliff, so it's very volatile. We've seen the beginning of lockdown, the stock market fell off a cliff. So that demonstrated that that could be volatile and it clawed its way back up. We've seen uh, bond markets struggle because low interest rates, there's no great opportunities that exist there. So when you, uh, when you consider the investment opportunities within the crypto space, right now you've got something that's performed very well for a month or six weeks maybe. But do you have to take the same view do you have to say to yourself i'm getting involved in this for the next 10 years i'm going to stay there i'm not even going to look at it yeah you know just like my stock portfolio there's nobody even looking at it forget about it okay again it's gonna it's gonna be a home run in 10 years time i've developed again there is so much happening in this space it's, it's just like the internet in the late 90s you the internet is now part of every business that we have yeah i agree us. i agree i was i was part of that whole process i had companies that I was working with where the secretaries and the cleaners were millionaires on paper with their stock options. I remember it really clearly. I was in Amsterdam working with telecoms companies and the IT companies and they were like, what do we need to talk to investment advisors for? We're millionaires. <laughs> and then obviously everything fell off a cliff and then, then it was like, are you still millionaires? Don't talk to me. I mean, it's such a shame because that's exactly what's happening again with the crypto bros and millionaires and, you know, a year ago it was like I, you know, Lamborghinis and and now it's nothing with the people who held on. I don't think you should hold on. I would say there's a guy called CTO Larson. Okay. You know, shout out to him. Don't know him, but I love his ethos. He was in the telecoms business. He was one of the 5G engineers at Ericsson, the Swede who created 5G. And he's now fully into crypto, has a YouTube channel, and he's also created an indicator. So you can he insists on if you're going to take buy my thing, you have to take my course that just gives you the basics. And I so I agree with what he's what he's um, selling in terms of the message. 
get to know it a bit more if, if it's your money and there are enough resources out there for you to get to know it and then decide who or what program you're going to follow and follow it. So he's proven, and this is where it's like buying stocks and shares. For example, I buy Amazon and I forget it, right? Or the Buffett buy Coca-Cola and forget it. Okay, if you want that. But I would advise get somebody, an expert, somebody who's better than you, who knows when to sell because you're going to actually buy it at a lower price a bit later on and then get back in. So it's not about leaving and never touching it again, but don't let it fall down, you know, as it is. What's amazing, and people, so many people don't know this who are even in crypto, is there are many things you can automate. So there are, there's something called coin panel. So watch CTO Larson interviewing the coin panel guys. Coin panel automates, you can tell it if this starts going up buy, and if it goes down a bit by a percentage, 5% sell, and then buy and sell. Sophisticated stock it's losses. literally a robot that does what you would do and you just let it run okay these things exist and this is where I'm saying you can use technology spend a bit of time let technology help you don't Bitcoin Michael Saylor buy hold for life great he can afford to but it's not the ideal way uh, but that's just my take because again I just follow so many people and I've made mistakes but I've also I've gotten out when I saw some things going down and I'm on the sidelines. But it's a process. And just back to your company again before we finish. You're taking people that want to be in the crypto space and turning them, turning them into a brand. Is that essentially what you're doing through media? Um, number one, so Metcalf.com. I get people to buy their first crypto. So yeah. we'll go through a workshop. So yeah. if I'm in a company... Teach them how to buy their first crypto. Literally lawyers, doctors, and especially people in finance and bankers. We've onboarded them. So we do the, ideally, it's three hours before you buy your first $10 worth of Bitcoin. And a lot of people think you have to buy $1,000. You can buy $100 worth. So that first time and give them a couple of tools of how to continue, number one. Number two, if you're a company or somebody wanting to launch a crypto product, so an NFT, an artist a year ago through a gallery wanted to launch 69 NFTs, sat with them and said, here's an ideal way to do it. You have your followers, but how are they going to buy it? You know, you have people who like you. So literally within that, we trained the girl to actually be the person who's going to help you buy your NFT because a person who's got $100,000 doesn't want to download an app themselves and do it unless they want to. So my point is you have to apply a lot of real world business use case scenarios to your crypto launch or if you're a crypto company, so the other part is bigger crypto companies and how they're communicating with the big mm. world out there. Um, strategy online, this is what you should do on LinkedIn, Twitter, and here's a bit of TikTok. But what's the mix? My real point is you start to experiment and you develop along the way. Use real world people tactics and business tactics to grow. Mm. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, last question. We saw Sam Bankman freed frighten the living daylights out of most of the crypto investors in this world thinking what really could happen the money went missing you know you've got these 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 famous celebrities supporting it but it fell off a cliff like an almighty cliff in a way that we hadn't seen since bernie madoff yes are we done or do you think there's more Not to come at all and the big difference there is if <laughs> you know sam bankman free the moment he said that he's doing it and he's going to give all his money away is the moment you should run. Anybody who makes crazy promises like that, you'd want your person who is taking care of your money to actually want to make money and, and invest it. So with that, very simple. It was a straightforward scam, a bit like the Theranos girl. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody who everybody believed in their story and gave them money, but it's, it's exactly what is centralized. It's just like a bank that takes everybody's money and then... Uh, failed. So Wells Fargo, for example, was, I don't know if you know, but you know, mm -hmm. they, again, they, they were creating false accounts. And again, it's because they could, because it's centralized. My point is, it's just another company. Within crypto, there are a lot of buzzwords. Decentralized is one of them. If you don't understand what it means, then don't uh, invest. Yeah. And if they say it, but there's no smart person proving it against their way. I could say I have a decentralized company and there's a website. What does that mean? Nobody knows, nobody cares, and all the money goes to me, and then I'm in the Bahamas. So my point is a bit of homework. 
and there's enough bad eggs out there. Oh, exactly. It means, means you've got to be cautious. Crazy. Yeah, no, and you know, a, a, a crazy young guy who thinks that he's a magician, I mean, you, you just need to just walk out of the door here and you'll find a few of those. Jamil, thank you so much for coming to join us on the show today. Your wisdom has been very valuable, and I'm sure our audience will be really appreciative of this easy way that you describe this complicated world of crypto. Thank you. I'm a huge admirer of yours. Continue what you're doing. I love your consistency, and it's a pleasure to be on this side of the mic where amazing people have been. I can't believe that I'm here too. <laughs> cool stuff. Nice to see you. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.